The more risk, the more reward, and the longer your money's tied up, the higher you'll get paid. This week, I'm excited to talk to Peter Malouk. He is the president and CEO of Creative Planning. Creative Planning is a registered investment advisory firm that manages. At first, I was told 90 billion. Yes, that's with a B, but now I understand it's gone over $100 billion in assets under management. It serves clients in all 50 states. Uh, both Creative Planning and Peter have been recognized as industry leaders by organizations such as Barron's, Financial Times, and CNBC. RIA Channel, which happens to be published by Forbes, recently ranked Creative Planning as the number one wealth manager for 2020. Along with Creative Planning, Peter also provides financial education to those who have been underserved by the financial service industry. He and his wife have received awards such as the Giving the Basics Human Dignity Award and the Variety Presidential Citation Award. He's also founded a nonprofit dedicated to providing under-resourced communities with actionable financial education. How in the world he ever found time to talk to us, I have no earthly idea. Uh, but that is Peter in a nutshell. Peter, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be with you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate your time. And I just want to, I got so many questions I want to dive right in. And it seems to me a good place to start since we're recording this in early to mid-November uh, is uh, inflation, which came out today at 6.2%, I think. And um, I went to the old internet and found that we have to go back to 1990 uh, on an annual basis to find that number, to find an inflation number that begins with six. And at the time, and I'm looking this up now, just to make sure I get this right, the Fed funds rate, 7%. Mm -hmm. Today, it seems like it's a negative 34%, although that's probably a little uh, extreme. <laughs> so I guess two questions for you. What do you make of sort of the interest rate and inflation environment? By the way, I'm not asking you to predict anything, although feel free to if you want. And then maybe the more important question is, should investors care? Should we change our portfolio or should we just stick with whatever our plan is and just completely ignore inflation and interest rates? Well, first, I mean, the, the debate is, is this transitory, meaning is it going to go away? Uh, is this temporary shock to the system or is it permanent, meaning we've got high inflation, this is going to stay around for a long time, it's a result of monetary policy? And I think most likely the answer is both. We have some components of this are clearly transitory. So, we some of these things that are driving inflation are going to go away. We do know no one's disagreeing that we have supply chain issues, containers not in the right places, ports don't have uh, the ability to accept everything that's you know sitting there ready to be accepted. We don't have truckers, enough truckers. We have uh, all, all sorts of things, chip shortages and so on. Those are going to resolve themselves. I mean, everyone agrees on that. The question is, how long is it going to take? Okay, so that's we have a lot of transitory elements like that. Trump shut down um, immigration. I don't think we need to rehash why, but it, it was constrained under Trump. And then he then because of the pandemic, immigration was basically shut down. And then we've seen the Biden administration not really return legal immigration, I think, because they're worried about the political consequences of, you know, leaving people at the border and then opening legal immigration. Plus, you have the pandemic. So we have that constraint. That's a couple million people that are missing from our workforce. That's tr that's also transitory. That's going to be resolved. We're eventually going to turn on immigration, especially legal immigration. And then we have a lot of people that retired early. You know, my dad is 86. He was actually going to practice medicine for three more years. He got tired of doing it via Zoom and he quit. <laughs> well, there are three million people like my dad that wound up retiring early. Eventually, we work through that, right? So all of that, all those elements are transitory. I think one of the things we don't hear about that's transitory is a lot of people that went home, they're trading, uh, you know, non-fungible NFTs, they're trading um, cryptocurrencies. And you know what? Why go to work making $15 an hour when you're making hundreds or thousands of dollars a week buying cryptocurrencies and watching it go up? I personally think that's transitory, too. I think there's going to be a bloodbath of unprecedented proportion uh, with all of this kind of trading. Uh, that will that's also going to resolve itself. Okay, that's the transitory part. Uh, the permanent part is, you know what? I don't think Chipotle is going to lower their prices. I don't think McDonald's is going to lower their prices. I think these increases that we've seen in a lot of the economy are here to stay. Will gas prices eventually come back down? Will housing prices eventually normalize? Yes. Uh, so part of it is more permanent. I think the permanent part is because we have 
near record low unemployment. This is the first time since we've had computers where there are more job openings than there are people looking for work. It's absolutely amazing uh, when you think about how long it took from 08 to now to get there. Now, we'd hit record un low unemployment uh, right before the pandemic, and then now we're on our way back uh, to that point again. That kind of thing creates more permanent inflation because you get wage inflation. Mm -hmm. Instead of just hiring somebody unemployed, you got to hire somebody. McDonald's has to hire somebody from Burger King and pay them more. What's unique, and I promise, Rob, every answer won't be this long. What's unique this time is the behavior of the Trump administration and the Biden administration and the Federal Reserve is as if we're in a deep depression or recession. So we have low unemployment, we have high inflation, yet the Fed is keeping interest rates very low, which makes it easier for people to buy houses and cars and pay more for them and boats and planes and everything else and businesses to borrow and buy businesses. It's fuel on an inflationary fire. You have a massive stimulus bill coming out now. I forget about the politics of it. It's just money going into the system. This is the kind of thing you do if you're trying to reinvigorate an economy it's the opposite of what you're, you're supposed to do if you're trying to control inflation. And that is the unprecedented element of this. That's what makes all this unpredictable. Because, yeah, parts of this are transitory, but we're pouring gasoline on the fire. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. As far as investors go, when there's inflation, it's better to be an owner than a lender. Right. If there's inflation, you want to own businesses, you want to own public stocks, you want to own real estate. You don't want to be loaning money to somebody at 2 3% when there's inflation of 6 You're losing. So it's really benefited asset holders. And I think because of that, it's widened the gap between the rich and the poor, which is a whole other problem right, that we're going to have to deal with. So but now, sort of drilling down on the, on the investor uh, viewpoint, if you take a typical, I don't know if there is a typical, but a long-term investor, you know, they're at least 10, 20 years away from retirement. And I know you're a big fan of index funds, so maybe they've got a well-diversified portfolio of index funds. Uh, it, it, let's assume they're, they're okay with risk. Is there a place uh, for bonds in that sort of long-term portfolio? Well, I think if you're talking about maximizing wealth, just purely that question, the answer is no, right? So if you're looking at, hey, Peter, I'm going to give you a pile of money. I'm going to, I want it back in 20 years. I'm not going to own any bonds in that situation. Now, most people are not emotionless robots and most people have goals. So we have a lot of bonds, probably 20% of the money, money, money we manage at Creative Planning. I mean, tens of billions of dollars is bonds. Why do we have them? Why do my parents have them? Why do some of my family have them? Because we don't know what's going to happen in the stock market in the short run. The, the stock market's very predictable in the long run, right? Over a 10 year period of time, 98 to 99 percent of the time, it's positive. Over 20 years, it's always positive and almost always will beat bonds over long periods of time. But over one year, uh, it's 75% chance it's positive, right? Over a month, it's almost 50-50. So if you're retired and you're taking money out of the portfolio, you better have a place besides stocks because we don't know when the next pandemic or 9-11 or 08 or 9 is going to happen. And we need a place to go to meet your monthly income needs. Otherwise, you're selling stocks while they're down and your portfolio gets depleted very quickly and all the rules you hear about, 4% and so on, to throw them out the window. They don't work if you're taking money out of a portfolio when it's down 50%. Also, if you're near retirement, uh, you need to be thinking about bonds because we need enough bonds to get through a crack, not a pandemic, which was a couple of months from an economic perspective. You need to be able to get through a Great Depression or 08 or 09. So you really need bonds for five to seven years to not be at the mercy of the market. And then third, there are people that just can't handle it, right? Well, stocks do better than bonds, of course. If you want, can you handle your portfolio getting cut in half over a one year period and staying there for five years? Most people cannot handle it, right? And if you cannot handle it, then it doesn't matter what the numbers say. If you're going to jump off the roller coaster during the loop, you know, you're going to die, right? So we have to have bonds to manage that, that risk as well. And so th there's a lot of reasons and also opportunities to buy things where people should have bonds, but it's certainly not because over a long period of time, we think bonds are going to do better than stocks. Yeah. So for the bond portfolio, uh, say for someone that's retired, uh, someone with gray hair like like I have, um, you know, there's a lot of different. I mean, there's there's short term treasuries, and then there's emerging market debt, and they're right. they're not at all similar. David Swenson, who as you know, I'm sure no passed away not too long ago, but he ran the Yale Endowment, and he liked to have like half in tips and half in treasuries. So you're not really betting either way on inflation. You're sort of hedging, right. uh, which I kind that kind of appeals to me. But I'm curious what your view is for constructing a bond portfolio for someone in retirement 
short duration, intermediate? Are you sticking with treasuries? Are you doing any high yield? So I'm so glad you asked this question, Rob, because people talk about bonds like it's one thing. And I think for your listeners, you know, a bond is just a loan, right? I think most people, I've, even very, very high net worth people don't understand the bond market. So I'd love to just start with a little lesson. You know, if you loan money to the federal government, treasury bond. If, if you loan it to a, a, a county or your state, it's a municipal bond. If you loan it to a corporation like McDonald's, a corporate bond. And if you loan it to a company in trouble, it's a high yield bond. And then, of course, there's overseas and everything else, right? There's some adjusted for inflation that the government puts out. But the more risk, the more reward. And the longer your money's tied up, the higher you'll get paid. So when you look at, at that market, you need to decide what are you trying to accomplish. So, for example, if we need your money to be what most people are trying to accomplish is I need a safe haven to go. If things go sideways, I have access uh, to my capital, right? And so for our clients, we're looking at high quality bonds. I'm not interested in high yield bonds, which are you know, companies that are in trouble, junk bonds, because in a crisis, they go down like stocks. I mean, no thanks, right? I mean, the whole, if I need that drama, I'll just buy stocks and get a better return in the long run and pay, pay less taxes. I want to own high quality. So our philosophy at Creative, it doesn't matter where interest rates are. It doesn't matter uh, where the yield curve is is we're not messing around on the bond side. We want high quality bonds that we have a high degree of confidence are going to be there for our clients in the down markets. So I'll, I'll start there. That eliminates most bonds, right? Yeah. Now, when you're there, the question is, are we doing shorter term or longer term? And if you've got imminent needs, you have to be short term, which means that the yield today is like cash. If you don't have imminent needs and it's more of a hedge for the portfolio, I like intermediate where you're loaning money five, seven, eight years, and you're going to get usually an upswing in a down market. And so you've got some protection uh, and you're also not, not putting the portfolio at too much risk of a higher, um, of higher interest rates. Okay. And do you see, do you see tips having a place in that portfolio? I think tips can, can play a place too. I like the way David looks at it. I think interest rates are impossible to predict. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm borderline indifferent on not bothering with them or having half of the bond, having, having half of the bonds in them. All right. Well, I want to take a, a left turn here and talk about Bitcoin, crypto. Yeah. And I saw uh, you had sort of an exchange with Mark Cuban, right, over, uh, I think the bet was S&P 500 versus Dogecoin. At least that was one of the things. Yeah. Uh, did you guys actually ever cement a wager? Is there a wager in place? Yeah. So this was a kind of a, you know, this is something that got a little out of control. So I happened to be at the University of Kansas teaching two classes. I say teaching. I was a guest speaker for, for two different classes. And I'm going into the morning class and everyone's asking me about Dogecoin and how they're going to put all their money in Dogecoin. They've got the Robinhood app and how much should they buy. And I explained how it was speculative and whether it goes up or down, nobody knows and all that stuff. And there will be a couple of cryptocurrencies that likely emerge as winners. And that the probability it was Dogecoin is probably pretty low. Yeah. Somebody pointed out that Mark Cuban had suggested it might be a good idea on Twitter. And this was maybe the fourth or fifth time I've been teaching a class in high school or college where the kids interpret that message from him and a couple others that are pretty vocal about cryptocurrency as, hey, I should put all my money in there. When I know and you know, and I think every intelligent person in the world knows that there's no way on earth Mark Cuban has 1% of his money in Dogecoin, right? Not even 1%, right? But you have these people that are working these jobs, they're making... 8,000, 10,000 a year while they're at school and they're putting half their money in it, right? So I, he, I put out, I responded, you know, this is a terrible idea and this is not, you know, anyway, it started a thing where he then came back and before you know it, uh, there was a bet between the S&P 500 and Dogecoin, but he wanted to change it. So all of a sudden he didn't have confidence in Dogecoin and he changed it to Ethereum and Bitcoin versus S&P 500. Now, I have more faith in those, that those might be the ones that emerge. I don't know, right? There will be some, some that emerge. But I still took the bet. Um, and then he indicated some guidelines for the bet. I just accepted them. And then he refused the bet. So it this never sounds like an episode happened. of Shark Tank yeah. where he's he never like negotiating the deal. Up on it. But, you know, here's my thing is I, I actually like Mark Cuban. I think he's very, very smart. I mean, and, and I think that um, I and I've loved watching Shark Tank with my kids when they were growing up. It's a really great educational platform. And I think when you have a platform like that, you have to be very clear about who you're talking to and what those people are doing. And I think that it's fine to say, hey, if, if, if you're a, a teenager in college or you don't have a lot of money and you want to put 1% uh, of your money in this and just see what happens, great. 
But by the way, I'm putting one ten thousandth of 1% of my money in this. Yeah. I, I could lose 90% of my wealth and be fine. I think a little more context would be good because I think people are, are misunderstanding the level of commitment that some of the advocates have for the space. I, I think that is so such an important point because it's one thing for a billionaire or even a multimillionaire to throw some speculative money at, at a crypto. But the problem is f folks follow them on social media and then they make life altering decisions with their money and crypto. And I think a lot of people have, and I think they'll continue to get burned. But um, I guess just to sort of wrap that topic up, do you think there's a place for crypto, or I suppose gold for that matter, in a diversified portfolio, or for you, it's just not not appropriate? Well, so I look at gold and crypto very differently, and I know that's not how most people look at it. Uh, most people look at them as as all you know, kind of kind of a a store of value relative to the dollar. Here's how I look at gold. To me, the dollar bill isn't really money, right? It's a it, gold is money. So if you told me, hey, Peter. I'm going to put you in a spaceship a thousand years from now and you can only have dollar bills or gold. I'll take the gold, right? I mean, gold, we were using gold as currency when Jesus was around and we were using it a thousand years ago. We were using it a hundred years ago. And you know what it buys today? Exactly what it bought a hundred years ago and a thousand years ago. It's been a real store of value. And that's, so it's in a way it's really money. That's also why it sucks as an investment because it basically just, has gone up a couple percent a year on average. So an ounce of gold bought you a suit 100 years ago and it buys you a, a decent suit today. It's not really staying ahead of purchasing power, stocks, real estate, things like that that bring money to you. They stay ahead, which is why you know today's world, I'd rather have dollars buying stocks and real estate. Um, but if I was betting on something you know, for a thousand years, um, you could do the same thing in the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Egyptian Empire. I mean, of course, all those times you'd be better off just throwing gold in a closet and taking your spaceship a thousand years out. But none of us are going to be here a thousand years from now, right? We're living in a real world with real money that's used as currency. And, and it's, it is it is I agree with the crypto crowd. The federal government is purposely depleting the value of the dollar. Okay, There's a campaign to do that because it's easier to manage the debt. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to go to gold or Bitcoin. It means that you need to be invested in a way to stay ahead of um, inflation. Right. That gets us back to stocks, among other things, I suppose. That's uh, right. Everything seems expensive right now, right? Yeah. Uh, stocks, bonds, real estate, crypto. Are there any values? Any? I'm not looking for a stock tip, but from an asset class level, are there any values out there right now that, that, that you could share with us? Or is it, there is, is it all expensive? There is no bargain anywhere. There's relative value, right? Like if you look at what's just on fire, right? You have these meme stocks, you know, AMC, Tesla, all of that. That party is going to end, right? So I'll say that with some conviction here, right? Yeah. I think you, you see a lot of people hedging. That party is going to end. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. There are no new rules around that. Companies have to make money eventually or they go down right? Uh, unless Tesla is going to dominate the whole world, which I guess is possible, it's going to have to correct significantly. Yeah. Um, and same thing with meme stocks, which don't even have any profits. You know, forget about Tesla, which actually a great idea with a genius visionary that's running it, that's a leader in the space. So I'd separate that, right? And then you've got all these other stocks that are going to have a, a reckoning uh, that comes. I think 99% of cryptocurrencies are going to blow up and, and light the room on fire on their way out, right? There will be a few winners, okay? I don't know what they are. I'm sure there are people smarter than me that know which ones those are gonna be. So I'd set that aside as an explosion that's gonna happen at some point in the future. Then I would have markets that are just pretty hot. And, and interestingly, the bond market is one of them. I mean, 80% of bonds are paying less than 2% for the first time in history. If you're looking for the least value that exists, it's there. Um, after that, you have segments of the market that are hot. I think if you look at the stock market, uh, it's high relative from, compared to relative norms, but it's not the tech, it's not the tech bubble. The PE ratios are not crazy. They might have to adjust by earnings going up or going sideways for a while, if, especially if interest rates go up. But if you were a buyer today, it's going to work out over five or 10 years. You shouldn't be buying stocks unless you got five or 10 years. And I think that's an asset class you could still say that about. 
And then I think when you go to real estate, it depends where you are in the market. There are some segments that are just on fire and some that you could place a, a bet on how they might work in the future that still have some value. Do you think there's any validity to the idea that someone, it, it might be a, a good idea to change your stock to bond allocation? Mm -hmm. uh, not because you're nearing retirement and you need to start spending the money, but because bonds are just so expensive. And so yeah. it's, it's not even really a timing issue. It's more of a valuation kind of realization. Or are stocks so expensive too that, you know, there's no, you really shouldn't be playing around with your allocation just because bonds are expensive. Right. I think you're, I think what you're, what, what's involved with that is a prediction on is the stock market going to go down or not and are interest rates yeah. going to go up or not. I think it's, that's dangerous. Our, our posture has always been, what do you need to get through a bear market? And let's have enough bonds to get through it. So going into the pandemic, everything was fine. Well, I mean, the stock market collapsed, right? And so I think that you had to have the right allocation there, even though everything on the equity side looked good. I would really encourage your listeners to get away from trying to figure out that piece of it and figure out what do I need and when do I need it and have the asset classes match up to that kind of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I kind of want to switch gears a little bit. How do you advise folks that are either in retirement or, you know, transitioning into retirement? They may have some income sources, Social Security, a pension. Maybe they annuitized some of their portfolio. Um, but, but with what's in their portfolio, they want to know how much can I spend each year without going broke? And of course, you've got obviously Bill Bingen's 4% rule. Um, but uh, how, how do you guys, you know, at your firm, figure out how much out of, a say, a million dollar portfolio, how much someone could take out at, say, a traditional retirement age? I start, I start to add all these things in because they, they matter, right? Um, right. But, you know, if someone's retiring at 65, how do you go about thinking through that question? So, I mean, the way we always look at it is what assets do you have? Which of those assets can bring money to you? And then also what income sources do you have? You know, Social Security, pension, rental property, whatever. And then we look at the gap of what, what income is going to be needed from the assets that bring money to you like in your, from your portfolio. From there, you know, your biggest risk, it, the, the way I look at it is one, you have sequence of return risk, right? Which means... Um, you know, you, you go into retirement, you're withdrawing, and the first four years are negative, you have a very diff different outcome than if the four, first four years are positive. Even if the long-term average rate of return is the same, uh, it, it, it really, that's the biggest risk a retiree has. How do you get away from the sequence of returns risk? You have enough bonds to get you through a severe bear market. That's how we look at it. Then you take the whole portfolio and based on the bond stock allocation, you could extrapolate the expected rate of return. You know, bonds today is going to be a couple points. Stocks, it, it depends if you believe Vanguard, BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, or, or whoever, but everyone's from 6 to 10%. But you put those two things together, you get a reasonable expectation, and you protect yourself from the sequence of return risk with the bonds. So at the end of the day, does it come somewhere near 4%? It actually does. And I, I think yeah. that that rule for a, I don't want to mess with anything, that rule's worked out for people. Yeah. And I, I, even on the conservative side, it's worked out. Yeah. Well, it, it, it kind of is a worst case scenario, at least based on historical data. That's right. Right, right. So I think the late 60s were the worst time to retire. But who knows? Maybe 2021 will beat out 1966, right? Um, I hope not. <laughs> I think we're okay. You, I, think we're, I think we're okay. You, you and me both. Um, okay. I want to turn to your, comp your firm in just a second. One last question. Uh, and I think you talked about this in, your, in the path, I think. I read, I've, I've read both of your books. Um, but it has to do with long-term care insurance. And I don't mm -hmm. want to dive into the nitty gritty because that could be a whole show. But I know that, you know, at some point you have enough assets you can self-insure. You've got, say, millions of dollars, perhaps. And you'll, you know, if you disagree, let me know. If you don't have much in assets at all, you probably can't afford it. And you'll end up relying on Medicaid if you have to, right? But there's that sort of in-between. And I'm curious if you have any rules of thumb or ways to think about, you know, the kinds of folks that would need to sort of strongly consider long-term care insurance. Yeah, I just consider long-term care tragic. We, we just don't have a good solution. We don't have a good solution for it. And, it and, and part of it is the reason that you're talking about. Like if you've got a few million dollars, say you've got somebody with $3 million, they're really fortunate. Well, they have enough money to pay for all of their long-term care. There's no need to buy the insurance policy. If you have a million or less, paying for that insurance policy can really alter your probability of being able to retire because it's such an expensive policy because one in two of us needs long-term care if you're married. 
odds are 75% mm -hmm. one of the people will need long-term care. For the people in between, it's having one of the, the two people need long-term care could bankrupt them, right? But it's still going to hurt to pay for it. So for that small group, I like structuring a policy in a way where you have a, a chance, you have a, a really good chance of covering your need. Now, most, while the statistics are bad, the majority of people that do need long-term care, a married couple, about 75%, need it for two years or less. We don't really need to insure for that. Most people you know, can get through that. So really the probability we're going to have a, lo a, a long one, kind of that Ronald Reagan type you know, scenario, mm -hmm. Um, it's lower, but it's still very significant. And it's the biggest contingent liability most couples face. It's the biggest potential liability that could happen to them in the future. I like structuring those policies with very long um, elimination periods. An elimination period is the way a long-term care policy refers to kind of a deductible. So you're basically saying, look, um, for the first 30 days, I'm going to cover myself. I like to take that to 180 days. For the first 180 days, I'll cover myself maybe even a year, I'll cover myself. The long-term care company is going to charge a lot less because most long-term care needs are for a short period of time. Well, you don't need coverage for the short period of time. We're worried about this very long Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, stroke type situation. And so trying to contain the cost to get the real coverage you need, which is that contingent tail risk, um, is, is one way to do it. And there's a lot, we could have a whole episode on this, but that's, that to me is the biggest, biggest piece of the puzzle. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, so let's talk about your firm. And um, uh, why don't you get, kind of just share with us what you do for clients? Well, I think if you, if you look at us in the landscape of advisors, there's a ton of advisors. We're in the independent world, meaning uh, we're a fiduciary to our clients. We don't own any of our own investment products. Uh, we don't get commissions on any investments. We're always sitting on the client side of the table, looking at the universe of investments and saying, what is the best that we can put together for you? And I think what we're known for is our experience. Um, we manage a little over 100 billion for people all over America in 65 countries. So we know what we're doing uh, in this space. We tailor everything. Every single portfolio is managed separately. We're not, we don't take somebody, put them in a model and trade them with everybody else. It really is built around their situation. And we're a full family office. We practice, we, we, we do wills and trusts for our clients, healthcare powers of attorney, financial powers of attorney. We handle tax work for them. We can serve as trustee for them in the event of their incapacity or death so their, their family can continue on with, with everything uninterrupted. We handle very complex to very simple financial planning for them and a lot of other things. And so I think you know people are attracted to us because of the way we manage money and all of those services, but also the experience that we bring in that space. We were the first firm in America to do this with scale. There are some imitators coming along now, but we were the first to do it in a way that I think um, resonated with the public and, and I think the breadth and depth of offering and the people here, I, I believe, are unparalleled. And I think that's what's attracted a lot of people to creative planning. Okay. So I know you use a, a, an assets under management model. Do you, do you have, offer services, I don't know if it'd be hourly or flat fee, for someone who says, I need some help with some of these things, but I want to manage my investments on my own? Well, someone can come in and say, hey, I want to do a will or a trust, or I need help with a business transaction or a tax return and just en engage for that service and, and exit. Absolutely. From a money management perspective, it, we're just assets under management based. Okay. Uh, so I read that like in 04 or 05, I think your firm managed, I think it was 30 million with an M. Mm -hmm. And then I was watching a talk you, you had with Tony Robbins, I think a year ago, and it was 50 billion with a B. And then it was 90 billion. And as you pointed out, as you corrected me, and I asked you this before we started this interview, you're now over 100 billion. Right. How in the, I mean, you know, let's assume you guys are the best firm in the world. There are still other really good firms out there that don't manage $100 billion. So how in the world did you accomplish that? Well, I, I, I don't know that there is another firm that has the breadth and depth in the independent world of the offering we have. Um, maybe there is, but I don't know that, that it's as experienced as we are that's working with as many people that we are. So I think part of it is just the number of, of people that we were working with. I also would bookend our success around two crises. You know, going into 08, 09, we managed about 500 million. Um, we came out of it at around 2 billion. And we went into this crisis. We had touched 50 billion and a week later, you know, the market started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Um, and this week we passed a hundred billion. I think that we, we do for our clients, what we say we're going to do, uh, we do it quickly and efficiently, and we do it with 
very, very talented people. Our people are credentialed and educated. Uh, they're not salespeople. I mean, they're real advisors, uh, whether they're JDs, CPAs, CFPs, and so on. And I think when you're in a crisis, that's when you really decide, you know, are, are these people, are they doing what they say they're going to do? Did my portfolio behave the way I expected it to behave? Um, and I think we delivered on that. And I think that, that clients then become advocates through periods of time. So those two crises have really, I don't want to have another one anytime soon, but those two really um, helped us, I think, stand out. And, and to your point, Rob, a very cluttered field. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I just want to kind of wrap up. I, you've, you've published The Path rec more recently, and then The Five Mistakes, The Five Mistakes Every Investor Makes and How to Avoid Them, which I will tell you is a book I personally loved. Um, they're both great, but that one I just resonated with me for some reason. But I noticed, like on The Path, you're working with Tony. You've worked with him on other books. So two questions. How in the world did you get connected with Tony Robbins? And have you walked on hot coals? That's, those are the two <laughs> things I've got to know. No, on the latter. Okay. Um, on, on the former, he had written a book called Money Master the Game. It became the best-selling book. Uh, I, maybe it still is uh, of this century so far in finance. He had uh, His 401k plan had, had moved from a broker to a fiduciary. Uh, his name's Tom Zagator. He works here at Creative Planning, running our, our 401k startup division. And uh, he was, you know, Tony was mad. He had been paying almost 3% and he, wow. his fees went, his fees went down to 0.8 and he under, started to investigate what a fiduciary was. He talked to some of his friends, Charles Schwab, Alec Greenspan, Vogel, um, Ray Dalio, and he, he's a big note taker. And he decided, um, you know, Simon and Schuster said, Hey, if you put all of these interviews, and they were like 50 interviews in a book, you know, we'll publish it. And he hadn't done a book in 20 years and certainly not on finance. He did that. And he also wrote uh, some chapters on what he learned. And a lot of my clients came in with that. Um, next thing you know, Tony and I are talking and uh, we wound up writing a couple books together, Unshakable, and then, um, which he wrote a, a, most of, and then The Path, which I wrote most of. And, um, you know, it was a really eye-opening for me. I got, I, I got to learn a lot uh, from him. It opened up a whole different world for us. We got to meet a lot of people we wouldn't have otherwise met. And interestingly, in the very, very affluent space, I mean, I was at, at lunch with a, you know, someone in the top 20 on Forbes uh, that came to us that way uh, in San Francisco is contemplating our services. And, and a lot of people at 25 million up space and then a lot of people in that under 500,000 space. So it really introduced, you know, a lot of people to creative planning that wouldn't have heard about us otherwise. Uh, it was a, a great experience. And, you know, you had so many connections within the industry that were so knowledgeable, that, that was valuable too. That's great. Well, one last question that I promise I'll let you go. Uh, and it, you, your reference to ultra high, high net worth folks. I hear a lot of folks tell me that the, the super wealthy have access to investments that the rest of us just don't have that help make them wealthy. And I, I just don't buy it, but right. uh, here's my question. Someone comes in with a hundred million. To me, an index fund portfolio would be perfect. It doesn't yeah. matter. They've got a hundred million. Okay. Right. Do you, do you see special investment opportunities that the ultra wealthy have that the rest of us don't, or do you have clients with 250 million that say, yeah, let's do a three fund portfolio. That's all I need. So at first I would say that there's this feeling that people that have a hundred million or 300 million are, are much more brilliant than, than people that don't. I would say that's just categorically untrue. I mean, I just think that there's smart people in every category and, and uh, the amount of good fortune that comes into this. Um, is remarkable. And I've just witnessed that, um, you know, at, at a level that few people in the world have witnessed, just being able to sit with people who are very, 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 very exceptional at what they did. Right. But that doesn't translate to other areas. I can tell you that I, I, my, what I'm good at does not translate into a lot of other areas as my kids will point out you know, <laughs> repeatedly to me. Um, and I think that they're not any savvier in investing. In fact, I think that when you look at the the $100 million person, when we're going into their family office, um, they're usually lacking ETF. They'd be way better off in an ETF portfolio mm. than what they're doing. But it is true. They do have access to different things than people. And they do have access, different investments and different lending and everything else. So I'll, you know, I'll give you some examples. If you've got somebody with that kind of wealth, they are going to get into alternative investments that the door is going to be closed for other people. They really will be able to invest alongside Yale and the Australian pension and so on. That's for real. Will those assets necessarily outperform? Maybe, 
you know, some of them, there's a lot of evidence that if you look at some of these alternative investments that over long periods of time, a, a basket of those will outperform the public markets. I don't believe in hedge funds, but I think if you look at other spaces like private lending, private equity, and so on, there is a lot of evidence that certain groups, it's repeatable. And it makes some common sense because an, a, a very strong PE fund that's been around 20 years is simply going to see opportunities others don't. I see that from my clients selling. They don't go look at the list of 8,600 private equity funds. They call the top 20 and their banker calls the top 20. That's the first look. You know, Andreessen Horowitz, Bain Capital, Carlisle, they're getting the first look, right? So they're seeing things others don't see. And they have the skill set to grow it that others don't. They have the bargaining power to get better loans for leverage that others don't. They have the ability to exit in ways others don't. Like how many private equity funds can take a, pub, a company public? Less than 5%, right? But, but that's one avenue to maximize value. Right. So there are some things that are repeatable there. They also get to borrow money at a lower rate. Yeah. And they can borrow against their portfolio and, and not pay a tax, whereas a typical person's got to sell. So there are some advantages and they also see a lot of private deals. But what I would tell you is most ultra affluent are worse off because of these opportunities because they wind up picking the wrong alternative investments yeah. and they wind up doing 40, 50 private deals. And, and they're surprised, you know, when the huge majority don't work out. Uh, and so it's very hard to build a private company portfolio if you're not very sophisticated in that in that space. OK, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll have links to creative planning. If folks want to follow you personally, is Twitter the, the way to do it? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter and also LinkedIn and, okay. and Facebook. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Peter. Yeah, great to be with you, Rob. It was fun.